the general election, um, just real quick, the most important number, in a, and I, I'd be interested in Larry's thought on this, I believe overwhelmingly the most important number in a uh, general election involving a sitting president is his approval rating. I believe that Barack Obama will run within two points of his average approval rating in the, in the pick them period, six months before the vote. That is our history. Uh, you know, I remember having a conversation with Mark McKinnon about the 2004 campaign, and he basically said, you know, he spent half a billion dollars trying to get George Bush from 49 and a half to 50.1, <laughs> and that's basically what you're dealing with. You have a lot of fixed opinions about about a sitting president. If you're a Republican and you are considering that history, you know, the current number is a little um, uh, uh, positive. It's positive for Obama and a little daunting for the Republicans. The fact that he is so close to 50 with unemployment still at 9%. If unemployment continues to decline, he would have a reasonable expectation of getting over 50 and being in a very commanding position for re-election. Now, part of the reason he's at 50, despite uh, unemployment being where it is, is because the face of America is literally changing before our eyes. We've gone from 12% of the electorate being non-white when Bill Clinton was first elected to 26% in 2000. And eight, and part of the reason Obama's approval rating is so high is because his numbers among non-white Americans have held up. In fact, his approval rating among whites is under 40%. If, if this was Bill Clinton's time and Bill Clinton's approval rating was 39% among whites, his overall approval would probably be more like 43 or 44. He would be in a much more precarious situation. And the odds are that um, non-whites will be an even larger share of the electorate than they were in 08, than they were uh, in, in 2012, than they were in 08. Uh, because their growth has been steady. It wasn't like there was some big spike from 04 to 08. It's just basically gone up two and a half points or three percentage points as a share of the vote uh, each of these past five elections. Um, if the non-white share of the vote, kind of close with this thought here, uh, if the non-white share of the vote grows to even 28 percent of the electorate and Barack Obama wins three quarters of it, he won 80 percent of it in 2008, mathematically he'd only have to win about 40 percent of whites in order to win a majority of the vote, and we can talk more about the map. I do believe there are enough states that you can win with that kind of model. The problem is Democrats didn't even get to 40% in 2010. In 2010, Republicans, according to the exit poll, won 60% of all white voters in House elections, and they did better than that in a number of the Senate elections. In the history of polling, which goes back to 1948, only twice before had either party ever reached 60% uh, in House elections. Uh, you look at a state like Virginia, for example, just to pick one. Um, if the, the, and the census numbers have come out, the non-white share of the population has grown even from 08 to 2010. Non-white voters were 30% of the electorate in 2008. The odds are there'll be a point or two higher in 2012, which means, I did the math the other day, Barack Obama could probably win Virginia with as little as 36% of the white vote. But you know what? They couldn't get there in 2009. They got to 32%. Um, uh, last point, very quickly. The most, there is one truly fluid part of the electorate, I believe, uh, looking forward to 2012. I believe that Obama will continue to do very well with minority voters. I think Republicans are being driven toward positions on immigration that will make it hard for them to improve much among Hispanics, although they may improve a little because of the economy. I also think that there's virtually nothing Obama can do that can get him back to his meager 40% of the vote among blue collar whites in 2008. I think that is baked in that it's gonna be lower than it was in 2008. The fluid part of the electorate is that upper middle class, white, college educated electorate. On the coasts, they stayed with the Democrats and helped Michael Bennett, that's fun, functionally a coastal state, Barbara Boxer, you know, Connecticut, Delaware. In the interior, they moved away from Democrats. Do Republicans nominate someone who can speak to those voters? Do they nominate someone who drive them back to the Democrats through cultural conservatism? I think that to me is one of the critical questions because there is clearly an opening for Republicans there. We saw it in the suburbs of Philadelphia. We saw it in the suburbs of Chicago where Sestak and Giannoulis significantly underperformed with those voters. Um, but there is also the opportunity for Obama, depending on how the debate uh, unfolds, to kind of isolate the Republican nominee, consolidate those voters, and be relatively secure in 2012. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, Charlie, Larry, let's pick up on some of the trends that uh, Ron and Jonathan talked about. Changing party coalitions, uh, can y'all talk about within your own party coalition how it's changed over the course of your career and what it means for the kind of candidates you nominate? Well, uh, Ron's analysis is very expert and th the fact is that when I first got involved in the 70s, it was a country club Republican party that participated in primaries. Uh, what we used to call Reagan Democrats 
in 80 and 84, a lot of them became Republicans. And a lot of them and, and, and their children now participate in Republican primaries. What, what you had in uh, 2010 as some more independent voters, Republican leaners or independents who haven't been participating in primaries turned out to vote. You can call it the Tea Party phenomenon. Actually, there are hundreds of Tea Parties at the local level, and, and sometimes those folks were turned out by a local Tea Party. In some cases, they just came out to vote on their own. But I expect a lot of that, quote, Tea Party vote to show up in Republican primaries uh, also uh, next year. Now, that said, every state is different. As Ron described, Iowa is so different from New Hampshire that it's unbelievable. In South Carolina, the number of Republican identifiers and people who vote in the primaries is growing dramatically in, in local and state elections as well as in the presidential. So uh, you may see a lot of people who aren't uh, socially conservative evangelicals turning out in South Carolina this year. I haven't looked at any polling on it. In the general election, uh, again, I defer to his analysis. We have to do very well with blue collar white voters we do have to hold a significant number of the upscale white voters, but we have to, Republicans absolutely have to do better in the Hispanic community. Two points better, four or five points better, but we have to do better. And I think that opportunity is there because uh, I do not assume that we will nominate someone who rails against immigrants. In fact, I expect the opposite to happen. And therefore, we won't be disqualified in the minds of a lot of Hispanic voters. And they care about the economy just as much as the rest of the electorate. So again, it depends, uh, as I said, <coughs> my, my first uh, thing I listed as a threat to the president's reelection is the economy. That applies to all those voter groups I'm discussing. Larry, how about your party coalition? We did see, I think, a. Um, something very different in 2008, which goes to kind of the component uh, parts of the electorate that Ron mentioned, and also the math that Jonathan mentioned. And I think part of this uh, came from uh, a bunch of new participants, and uh, where those guys come from? Well, I in part it was because of uh, a primary process that, that so uh, mobilized people and so uh, captured people's um, attention and uh, energized them that, that a bunch of people signed up and registered to vote who had been uh, previous non-registered registrants, got involved in, in uh, primary participation who hadn't previously been general uh, election voters. So you kind of had a, a surge of new Democratic registrations, uh, new voters that, that started through the primary process and then continued uh, in through the general uh, election. There was, I think, a, a mistaken impression during the campaign that this was a exclusively a, uh, a sort of a youth uh, movement. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think that the, the data has been pretty clear that, that there was, uh, it was more than that, uh, that there were a whole bunch of people uh, who'd kind of been sitting out uh, at all um, ages um, and from coming from different um, uh, ethnic groups that, uh, th that got involved and got engaged in the 2008 election. And that changed a lot of things uh, in the coalition. I mean, if we, and, and one of the things that I think, um, uh, I think is sort of a common theme in all these conversations that we're having about demographics and the electoral map, which is all important, is uh, our experience in 2008 about the appeal uh, that President Obama had to the, uh, to the electorate was it's not conventional. <laughs> Our conventional wisdom, and I'm and I'm very uh, uh, reluctant to say this in front of a crowd of political mm -hmm. consultants because we, as a group, are <laughs> we are the purveyors of conventional wisdom. But in but in fact, we had very um, with the help of our friends. Yeah, in I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, but um, uh, the the, the kind of non-conventional uh, route that that campaign took told us a lot about. Uh, uh, how to run a campaign and, and what President Obama's appeal was, Senator Obama at the time. And I think if there's anything as I look forward to 2012 that I'm pretty certain about is how we approach the map, what kinds of people end up coming together uh, to build a winning coalition is not going to be uh, sort of built on kind of the conventional building blocks of partisan politics. 
One of the other things that's, that's changing dramatically um, that, is, that, that adds a little fuzziness to the, to the very clear analysis, analysis that, um, um, that Ron gave us was we're, we're um, uh, not operating in an environment in which partisan identification drives people the way that it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, so there's more moving parts uh, available to you in the electorate than there would be on the in the days when you basically said, look, in this precinct, I know these number right. of Democrats are going to vote Democrat, and these number of Republicans are going to vote Republican, and it doesn't really matter, it, you know, the, the, la the rest is at the margins. Right. <coughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, just jump in, guys. Yeah. Jonathan, sure. Ron. Um, uh, I think Larry makes an important point, uh, uh, several, but one important point you made was that you know, even when you look at kind of the broad distribution of the allegiance of groups and how they vote nationally, there is a lot of variation state to state and region to region. For example, for whatever reason, uh, Obama did significantly better with working class whites in Ohio than most places, maybe union presence or, or whatever. Having said that, and, and, I do think, and I do think that there is this kind of uh, variation between the coasts and the, the heartland. I think we saw that very clearly in 2010. Uh, in 2010, in Senate and House ra in, in Senate races, Democrats did much better with college-educated whites on the coast and in the heartland. And I think it's because they're more secular on the coast, and that would that would explain it. Now, having said that, that there is regional variation. I still think that if you kind of look at what has been the consistent patterns of public reaction to Obama, that that has big implications for the map and geography of 2010. Um, the states that are are dominated by working class whites, like for example, Ohio 2008, half the vote were white voters without a college education. Wisconsin, half the vote roughly was white voters without a college education. Um, Indiana is in that ballpark. Um, every indication I think is that these are gonna be very tough places for him. I mean, he's looking at an approval rating among you know non-college whites. It's consistently running at 35% or below among the non-college whites who voted in 2010, it was at 30. 30, it's a pretty low number. On the other hand, I think that if you kind of look at, and so those states I think are, are tough, I, all, but I do think that there are, uh, I, I, if, if, if uh, there, there is a path to 270 even without some of that that was there, and it really, it really is kind of, I think, uh, oriented more towards states that kind of look like him, that are both educated and diverse. Um, and uh, you know how they all sort out of uh, Virginia versus Nevada versus Colorado versus Florida versus North Carolina, um, New Mexico. Um, my guess is that, that uh, absent a big economic recovery, you are not going to want to leave many of those on the table mm -hmm. in 2012 because I think I think you're going to need them. Is it my my guess? And I was I was just struck, you know, in, the, in that in, the, in a piece, kind of looking at some of these trends, in interviewing your colleague and friend David Axelrod how he cited the Colorado example, you know, just, just real quick. Michael Bennett, according to the exit poll, lost two-thirds of white men without a college education and still won. Wow. You know, he won with college-educated women and minorities and young people. And that's not available in every state. Russ Feingold can't win that way. You know, uh, Ted Strickland couldn't win that way. You don't have a weak opponent in every state. Right, that's true. But, but also you don't have those people. <laughs> you don't have enough of those people in every but state. They dominated Jane Norton, Charlie. What's yeah. Well, most Democrats in Colorado think Jane would have won, but I'll, I'll mm. stay neutral. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, right? Um, 